Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. We are in the middle of a series called New Digs. It's a series about the armor of God. So far we've talked about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Well, let's look at the word and see what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. And again, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, where it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Church, today I have a confession to make. I'm hoping that after you hear this about me that you'll still be able to have at least some level of respect for me, at least somewhat similar to what you do now. But I have to admit to you, I have to confess to you that I have a problem. And this problem, as I get older, it gets worse. And I've actually seen that it started rubbing off on my children because Justin in particular has this same problem. And here it is. I love shoes. I said it. There it is. It's out there. You all know now. I am a man who loves shoes. I love shopping for shoes. I love trying them on, seeing how good I look in them. I love buying shoes. I even love picking out shoes to go with my outfit. I'm one of those weird guys that that when I'm wearing even like a T-shirt, I want to make sure that the the shoes I'm wearing match the T-shirt that I'm wearing. So if I'm wearing a blue T-shirt, you're not going to see me wearing red tennis shoes. I'm going to try to wear blue tennis shoes, and if I don't have any of those, I'm going to wear black or gray. I have so many shoes, it's not even funny. I, I probably have more shoes than just about every man in the room and many of the women. I actually have one of those things that you hang on your closet door. Have you guys seen those? You hang your shoes on the closet door, and it holds like 20 pairs of shoes. Yeah, I have one of those, and it won't hold them all. When we go to camp, I take an entire bag of just shoes. I love shoes. It feels good to get that off my chest. But it's rubbing off on Justin. Justin loves shoes. He's got one of those things on his closet, too, and it's not quite as full as mine, but it's getting there. He actually, he started working a little bit and making a little bit of money, and, and last week he bought himself a, a new pair of shoes that he got a really good deal on, and when they came in, I'll be honest, I coveted. They were really nice shoes. But he was telling me the other day about this guy that he follows on YouTube that has an entire room with shelves, floor to ceiling, all the way around it, full of, guess what, shoes. If I were rich, I would be that guy. Unfortunately, I'm not, so I just have a closet full. But in my defense, I do want to say this. There's a reason that I have so many pairs of shoes. And that's because I always want to have the right shoes for the job. Think about that for a minute. You don't want to, you don't want to go out and do construction wearing dress shoes, do you? That doesn't sound like a good idea. Or, or imagine you're going to go run a marathon. You probably don't want to do that in cowboy boots. Right? You want to have the right shoes for the job. I actually have this one pair of shoes. They are they're basically work boots, but they're not boots, they're shoes. They have leather uppers and steel toes and non-slip soles. 
And the sole reason I have those shoes, no pun intended, is because that's what UPS required when I was loading trucks there. And it didn't take me very long working there to find out why those were their rules. They required you to have leather uppers because leather is stronger than cloth. And if you dropped a heavy package on your foot, then it provided better protection. Not total protection, mind you. (laughs) I learned that the hard way. But better protection. And the steel toes, those were in case that package that you dropped was really heavy. Because then it might hurt really bad, but at least you wouldn't lose your toes. I still have all my toes. Raise your hand if you still have all your toes. Most of us do. That's a good thing. Zach, you don't? I hate that for you, bud. I'll pray for you. And it doesn't take you long loading trucks on a concrete dock in the rain or snow to figure out why they want you to have non-slip soles because it gets slick out there. You want to have the right shoes for the job. And that has never been more true for anyone than it was for a Roman soldier in Jesus' day. And I think Paul knew that when he looked out at the soldier who was guarding him in prison, and he told us in verse 15 to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You see, a Roman soldier wouldn't have just regular old sandals like everybody else. They wouldn't be wearing flip-flops around, right? They actually had a very special shoe that was called a caliga. And a caliga was basically an open-faced leather boot that had leather laces on the top that you would lace it up with. The caliga was well-designed for a soldier. It it would provide many things for them when they wore wore it. The first thing it would provide is protection both from hazard and attack. You see, when a soldier was marching into battle, they could never be sure what type of terrain they were marching into. They could never be sure if there would be jagged rocks or or sharp bits of glass or bone on the ground that they would walk into. So the Caliga had very thick, strong leather soles that could not be easily punctured by sharp items on the ground. The Caliga would allow a soldier to maneuver that environment with ease. In fact, it's been said that the Roman soldiers would actually take sharp items and throw them on the battlefield because they knew that it would not affect them, but it could hinder their enemy. Can you imagine that, going out to war and throwing a bunch of broken glass and broken clay and broken bones out on the battlefield? The upper part of the shoes had thick leather that would protect them from swords or arrows. And if you ever wonder how important it is to protect your feet against harm from either obstacles or attack, then I want you to try to remember the last time that you stubbed your toe. How does that feel? What about the last time you had a rock in your shoe? Has anyone ever had that happen? That's no fun at all. This is something that's all too familiar to me right now because a few weeks ago, Christina and I took the opportunity to go out with our kids and and we went down to the Siloam Springs Kayak Park, which is basically the Illinois River. So we went out there to the river and we played around and we floated around in tubes and I decided to to wear my Chacos. Let me tell you, I love my Chacos. They're some of my favorite shoes. Chacos are really, really good for so many outdoor activities. They're good to wear to, like, Branson to to Silver Dollar City because if you get on those water rides, you don't have to take your shoes and socks off. You just get on, you get wet, and then they dry as you walk around. They're good to go hiking in, and I even went caving one time in my Chacos. They have such good traction. I was really kind of surprised. But I learned that one thing they are not good at is playing in an Arkansas riverbed. You ever been in an Arkansas riverbed? We went down to that kayak park, and I was wearing those Chacos, and I'd be wading through the water, and I would stir up some rocks, little tiny sharp rocks, and then sometimes they would get stuck in between my sandal and my foot. Oh, my goodness, that hurts. 
It would, it would pretty much stop me in my tracks. And when it wouldn't, it would really, really slow me down. The same thing would happen to a Roman soldier if they were on the battlefield and they weren't wearing their caliga. They'd get little bits of sharp things in their feet, and then they had to try and fight in that condition. The first thing the caliga provided was protection. The second thing is traction. The caliga had little nails. They're called hobnails that were nailed into the bottom of the sandal all across the sole, basically creating first century cleats, similar to what football players and baseball players wear today These cleats would allow them to dig into whatever terrain they happen to be on. It could be slick mud or it could be loose gravel, and they would dig those sandals down, and it would give them traction so they wouldn't be driven back by the enemy. And if there was a situation where their enemy might slip and fall because it was wet, the Roman soldiers wouldn't that have the upper hand because they had the caliga with its cleats. And finally, the caliga would provide a firm foundation on which to stand. You see, when a Roman soldier was going into battle, they would oftentimes climb onto something. Whether it was climbing onto a horse or climbing onto a chariot or climbing over the fallen bodies of their comrades or climbing up on rocks or trees, they would climb. And I don't know about you, but... But to me, climbing on things with bare feet may seem like a fun challenge race, but it doesn't seem like a good way to go to war. Without the firm foundation that the Caliga provided, the soldiers would lose their balance and they would slip and they would fall. Many people have argued that much of the success that Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar experienced in their military campaigns was due to the fact that their soldiers' feet were well fitted with the Caliga. They had the right shoes for the job. And I'm not sure how familiar Paul was with the ins and outs of the military workings and of their uniforms. But I think he understood how important it is that when you're going into battle that you have your feet properly fitted. And that's why he told us to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, this is another one of those passages that that is easy to misunderstand or confuse if you don't really dig into it and see what it means. Many, many times I've heard people tell about how the the sandals of peace or, or the sandals of the gospel are all about spreading the gospel message. You put your shoes on so you can be ready to go out and spread the gospel. But that's not what it is. You see, it's easy to skip over an important word in this verse if you don't pay close attention. Let's look at what it says. It says, and have your feet fitted with what? What's it say? Preparation or readiness. Have your feet fitted with the readiness or the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace. The word that's translated there as readiness or preparation is hitoimasia. Everybody say hitoimasia. Hitoimasia is being prepared or being ready. So Paul tells us to fit our feet with readiness or preparedness that comes from the gospel of peace. In other words, he says, make sure you are ready in the way that the gospel of peace makes you ready. Prepare yourself for what's coming by using the gospel of peace. Let's look quickly at what gospel of peace means. Who knows what the word gospel means? Does anybody know? What's it mean? Good news. The gospel is the good news. The word gospel is used many times in the New Testament and even here to talk about the message that we have a Savior, the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, sometimes Paul calls it the gospel of Christ. Do you remember Paul saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? 
Gospel is just the good news of Jesus. But here Paul takes it a step further and refers to it not just as the gospel, not just as the gospel of Christ even, but as the gospel of peace. I want to explain what that means for us. We talked a few weeks ago about how we have a real enemy, right? We're in a real battle with a real enemy. Who is that enemy? Satan. Satan is our enemy, and he's a fierce enemy. He's strong. But did you know that we used to have another enemy, one that's even more fierce and more strong than Satan? Can anyone guess who that might be? Let's look at Romans 5. Chapter 10, or excuse me, verse 10 says this. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? While we were God's enemies. Did you know that you used to be God's enemy? There's a chance you're here today and you still are God's enemy. I don't know the condition of your heart. But I don't know about you, but if I found out that I was God's enemy, I would want to do everything I could to fix that. I remember when I was in, I think, seventh grade. I moved over to Oklahoma, to Stillwell, Oklahoma, and I lived with my aunt for a little while. And she taught at a school there. So instead of going to Stillwell schools, I went to the school that she taught at, which was Greasy Public Schools. Greasy. Who has heard of Greasy Schools in Oklahoma? Guys, I went there for all of a year. Let me tell you, the the town of Greasy is an Indian area. It's very highly populated with American Indians. And when I showed up, at that school as a little seventh grader, there was this huge, huge Indian that did not like the tall, skinny, white kid that showed up at his school. And I don't know why he didn't like me, but he didn't. That dude, in seventh grade, he had fists that I promise you are bigger than mine are today. And he would look across the room at me during class and go like this. That's scary. He did not like me, and he was huge. He was my enemy. I promise you, I wanted to make peace, whatever it took. And that's the same way that it is with God, or should be, when we find out that he is our enemy, we ought to want to fix that. We ought to want to make peace. So how do we make peace with God? Romans 5 verse 1 says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. You see, when Paul calls it the gospel of peace, he's saying that because it is our acceptance of the gospel message that brings us peace with God. It's our acceptance of the gospel that sets us at peace with our creator. And when we get that peace, it prepares us. Have your feet fitted with the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace. So I'm going to reword that, Ephesians 6.15. I'm going to put it in my own words, and, and this is what the CSV, the Clark Standard Version says. Put on the shoes of the preparation you receive through being at peace with God by accepting the gospel message. Put on the shoes of the preparation you receive through being at peace with God by accepting the gospel message. 
So what does being at peace with God prepare us to do? Two things. Number one, it prepares us to live. It prepares us to live. We've talked about this before, but life is difficult. Especially when we have an enemy who is constantly roaming around trying to find a way to destroy us. Life is difficult. We've talked about our enemy. We've talked about his tools. He's the father of lies. He's going to lie to you. He's going to tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough, that you're not pretty enough. He's going to tell you that no one likes you. He's going to tell you that no one could ever love you, least of all God. He's going to lie to you. He's also the accuser. He's going to accuse you. He's going to tell you that you mess up too much. He's going to tell you that your sins are too big to forgive. He's going to tell you you might as well just give up on this whole church thing because it's not going to matter. It's not going to make a difference in your life because you're a lost cause. He's going to lie. He's going to accuse you. He's going to attack your relationships. Satan, the enemy, will try to drive a wedge between you and your wife or between you and your girlfriend or between you and your friends or your family or your boss. Satan will attack your relationships. He'll attack your finances. He loves to do this right when you start tithing. I've seen it over and over again. Somebody comes to me and says, man, I'm pastor, I'm going to start tithing. And I'm like, awesome, praise the Lord. And then they come to me the next week and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Our air conditioner went out and our car broke down. He's going to attack your finances. Sometimes he'll even attack your finances in menial ways like making your pool pump go out. That seems like no big deal, but when you want to go lay in your pool, that's a big deal. I know from personal experience. He'll attack your health. He'll come at you with cancer or heart problems or aches and pains. Sometimes he'll even come at you with worries about sicknesses that you don't even have. Does anyone let Satan do that to you? You're worried to death that you're going to get cancer someday. You're sick about it, and you don't have cancer. Praise God. No reason to be worried. All of the ways that Satan attacks us can be rough. But we have someone on our side because we've made peace with him. The Bible tells us in 1 John that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Romans 8 says that if God is for us, which he is because we made peace, then who can stand against us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? And 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says that the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Yes, life is difficult, and we have a strong enemy. But the guy that we made peace with, if you have made peace with him, he's a pretty bad dude in his own right. He's pretty tough. I remember this one time. It was the summer between my eighth and ninth grade year. My best friend and I were at the movies, and we met a couple of girls because that's what Eighth and ninth graders did back then. You had your parents drop you off at the movies, and you tried to meet girls. So we met a couple of girls, and they were older than us. They were juniors, I think, which really kind of makes me wonder what their interest in us was. But we hung out a little bit. We went on a few dates with these girls. It was awesome. We would get dropped off at their house, and then they would drive us around. <laughs> Such losers. We went on a couple of dates with these girls, and, and one of these dates, we ended up at Taco Bell and Rogers, and we were sitting there at Taco Bell when one of the girl's ex-boyfriends, who we didn't know but was a recently made ex-boyfriend, showed up at Taco Bell and saw us hanging out with his girlfriend. He wasn't very happy. So he told us what he thought about us in no uncertain terms, and we, being who we were, told him what we thought of him. 
and and so words were exchanged there and and luckily for us that's all that was exchanged because it almost went further but the girls basically got in their car and said if you don't get in the car we're leaving you so we left um but my best friend had an older sister and she was dating a guy who was going to be a senior and he was pretty strong he like did weightlifting competitions and stuff and he actually went and had a talk with the guys that gave us trouble. And would you believe they never messed with us again? In fact, the next day, one of them offered me a ride home from football practice. He, I was getting ready to walk home. I would walk home from football practice. I was getting ready to walk home, and he pulled up next to me. He's like, hey, man, you want a ride? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I thought he was going to take me and beat me up. But he just took me home and dropped me off. Because the one that we had made peace with was bigger and badder than he was. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that Satan's going to start being nice to you. But I will tell you this. If you've made peace with God, Satan knows that the one that you've made peace with is bigger and badder than he is. The gospel of peace prepares us to live. It prepares us to fight the battle that Satan is waging against us. It protects us from the hazards and attacks along the way. It helps us stand in this fight without losing traction or falling or slipping. And it gives us a firm foundation to stand on. The gospel of peace prepares us to live and it prepares us to die. Have you ever seen The Princess Bride? The Princess Bride's a cool movie. I hadn't seen it in a long time, but I like that movie. The Princess Bride has this character, and he's spending his whole life searching out the person who killed his father. He's hunting them down to, so that he can kill them, he can return the favor. And whenever he finds someone who he thinks is the person who killed his father, he pulls his sword out and he looks at him and he says, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. In fact, when he's in the fight with the guy that did actually kill his father, he just repeats that over and over. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Prepare to die. I've heard people say, get ready to meet your maker. How do you prepare to die? Because we're all going to die. Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews 9.27 tells us that every person is destined to die. And after that, to face the judgment. You may have heard it said as it's appointed wants a man to die and then the judgment. Romans 14, 12 tells us that each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. We'll stand before God and give an account for what we've done. And Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15 says this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And then Revelation 20, 15 says this. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. 
Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The book of Revelation is a book of prophecy that tells us what's going to happen at the end of the world. And that book of life that it talks about there, we read is a book that when we make peace with God by accepting the gospel message, our name gets written down in that book. The gospel of peace prepares us to die. Because if we die and our name's not written in that book, then we get thrown in the lake of fire. It's not a popular thing to talk about in churches these days. We like to talk about God's blessings and we like to talk about how he helps us through life and we like to talk about healing and we don't like to talk about hell. But the fact is that there is a real place called hell. And that every one of us has a decision to make. We can make peace with God that will prepare us to face him. Or we cannot make peace with God and fail to prepare to face him. Either way, we're going to face him. Either way, we're going to give an account. But the cool thing is this. If your name's written in that book, when you get up to give an account for everything you've done, God looks at you and says, well, I don't see that you've done anything wrong. And you're like, what do you mean? I've, I've done lots of stuff wrong. He's like, I don't see it. All I see is my son's blood. But if you face God without making that decision, without accepting that gospel message and receiving that peace, then he sees everything that you've ever done. And he can't allow you to go unpunished because he is a just and righteous God.